Good afternoon. I'm late today for a multitude of reasons, but it's good to see you. <clears throat> a few years ago, I was sitting at my desk uh, studying, and my phone rang. And the screen lit up, and my son's name appeared. A smile came on my face. So I answered the phone, and I said, Hello, son. To what do I owe the honor? And there was silence on the other end. And then finally I heard this voice say, Well, you seem to know me. Are you my dad? And I said, Yes. Let me introduce myself. I'm Steve. I'm your dad. What's going on, Eric? And there's silence again on the other end of the phone, and he said, Is that my name, Eric? By this time, there is no smile on my face, okay? I'm, something is definitely wrong here. <clears throat> and I said, Yes, your name is Eric Scott. What is going on? And he said, um, it's really hard to remember, Dad. And about now, panic is starting to, to rise up in me, and my instinct is saying, call 911. And I ask him, so where are you, Eric? And he says, I'm sitting on the curb. Yeah, but where? Um next to a sidewalk and there's a bicycle with a bent front tire next to me. Well, gradually, as time went on, we pieced together a story that we think is correct. Uh, a pedestrian had stepped out in front of him while he was riding his bike and in avoiding her, he collided with a tree with enough force to mangle his bicycle and split his helmet wide open. He remembers a, a young man uh, helping him to straighten the tire enough so he could push the bicycle and asking him if he was okay. Um, but then he found himself alone with no idea who he was or where he was. He somehow managed to open his phone and when he pulled up the recent call list, there was, among the names, there was this name Dad. And that felt comforting. And so he punched the name and that's how we connected. Well, how do you call 911 if you don't know where you are? Back in those days, cell phones um, couldn't function as locators, and so we started walking. Him along the street in Virginia, and me pacing back and forth in my house in, in Illinois. It took us a while. Periodically, he'd say, Dad, I need to sit down, and we'd sit down together, him on the curb and me at my desk, and every time my heart would start racing. Is he going to pass out? How am I going to get him help if he passes out? But we kept, kept going, and he kept hanging in there, and finally we made it to a street sign, and within seconds I had his location, which was only a few blocks from his home, and help became a possibility. Last week, we continued our discussion of spiritual navigation, finding our way through life. And we talked about four tools, four spiritual tools that are found in the Bible that help us to do that. I put forward the law, the Holy Spirit, um, prophecy, and the stories of the Bible. But there's one critical element we didn't talk about last week, and that's deciding who we're going to trust. When my son saw the name Dad, 
He didn't know who I was. He didn't know who he was. But just the name Dad had a sense of comfort and safety that he reached out to. I'm honored. I'm far from perfect. And for many of us, the name Dad isn't comforting. It has dark undertones, violence, abuse, domination, estrangement. Our dads are human. They're imperfect, and we know it. But simply the fact that we know that they're imperfect suggests that in our mind there is this ideal of what a dad is supposed to be. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that he taught, is that God is like the ideal father. We can turn to him regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what we've done, and we can be guaranteed that he will meet us more than halfway. That's who God is to me. He's, he's gone from being a person I was supposed to talk to, according to the rules, to a person I didn't want to talk to, but who wanted to talk to me, to a person I talk to every day who I have a relationship with. But here's the kicker, okay? When you read the Bible, you find, it, you find the God, good news that Jesus taught, that the Father is, that God is our Father. But you also find this story in Matthew 7 that is uncomfortable. You see, there, Jesus is talking about religious people, and he says, not everybody who calls me Lord, Lord, is going to be a part of the kingdom. Only the ones who do the will of my Father. It's not about what we claim. It's about what we do. It's not about what we believe. It's whether we live our lives like he wants us to. Whether we follow his rules, the law. And the, in Jesus' story, he says that these people are really surprised. These religious people are shocked that they're standing in the wrong line on Judgment Day. And they say, uh, excuse me, excuse me, um, how can this be? Um, we, we witnessed for you. We, we praised you. We fought to get prayer back in schools. We fought to get the Ten Commandments, keep the Ten Commandments in the courthouse. We even pointed to heaven when we scored a touchdown when we were playing football. How is it that we're not a part of the kingdom? And Jesus says, and I'm going to have to declare to them, I don't know you. Go away, you lawless people. Which is why I put the law as the first of the navigational tools that the Bible presents for us for guiding us through life. When you love someone, when you love your father, you respect him. You respect him so much you want to be like him. It makes you proud when people say, wow, you're just like your father. Uh, in college words, that's called emulation. That's a big word that just means be like. Do you want to be like God? The law is simply a roadmap describing how to navigate your way through life, staying within the center of his will. But I've been talking about a lot of religious things lately. Have I forgotten about the spiritual but not religious? No, no, I haven't forgotten, okay? What we're talking about when we're talking about navigating through life is how to deal with the confusing times, the times when uh, trauma and trouble make us uncertain. 
And there are a lot of spiritual tools that we can use. Um, I have friends who are spiritual but not religious, who use yoga and meditation, um, who use physical exercises to calm their, their emotions. They're actually, religious people use those too. Um, those are real strengths. They help to center us, to focus us, to, to get us back to where we can think rationally when we've got this emotional storm going on. And there are relational strengths we can turn to as well. Friends, family, mentors. All of these things, all of these strengths are things that are common between the spiritual but not religious and the religious. What we're talking about today is something I've never observed in my friends who are spiritual but not religious. And that is a personal connection to the divine. Dad. Someone to turn to who's bigger than ourselves. We as humans crave relationships. Yes, we like power. But we really don't want to stick our fingers into an electrical socket when we need that power. So, do you have a dad, a spiritual dad on speed dial? I'm not talking about a fellow traveler. I'm talking about someone bigger and more awesome than you can dream of. I hope so. Be safe, my friends. Here in Southern Illinois, the, the clinics and the hospitals, the emergency rooms that I'm affiliated with, their volume has tripled this week. Largely because influenza and COVID are surging at the same time people are getting sick. So be safe, my friends. Be prudent. Practice the three W's. Wear your masks. Wash your hands. Watch your distance. But above all, keep looking up. Have a great week. I'll see you around.